Well, good morning, everyone. I wonder how morning. your week has Lovely been. Look, the church is still there. It's still standing. Well, and I it can't still see anybody, gorgeous. but I know you can see us. I know. No, but I mean, talking about the building on oh, the screen. <laughs> okay, yeah, the picture on the screen, yeah. yeah. Did you all have a good Easter weekend? It was a different kind of Easter weekend um, for all of us. And I hope you had a good week. As we walk into church this morning, let's just see. Speaking. Absolutely. Yeah. Let's just see who's been saying hi to us this week. And we have got Chris with Roger standing in the background there. Chris writes this, beating the lockdown in the spring sunshine among the buttercups of the ancient manorial lands in Dibbonsdale. I can just hear Chris saying that, can't you? <laughs> With it, love to our church family. It is lovely going for a walk down there. So yeah, it really is. Wonder, it's wonderful beautiful. To see them it there. really is beautiful. Now, thinking back to last weekend to Easter, a couple of lovely things were sent in to us. Firstly, pictures on the top from Anna and Owen. Now, on the left side, we've got Miriam and Benjamin standing in front of a poster that they had been doing before Easter. They'd been time traveling through the Easter story oh, from Palm Sunday to Easter Sunday. And I think they would have learned yeah. an awful lot yeah. doing that. So Brilliant well idea. done, guys. That's wonderful. And then Owen celebrating his birthday, having a wonderful family picnic safely Clever. indoors on the floor, locked down. <laughs> but that's the way to do it. Well done, guys. That's wonderful. The second thing that came in was the bottom picture where setting up there, you might not be able to see the figures, but we have Pete on his accordion and Phil and Carol setting up. On Easter Sunday morning, they did a wonderful socially distant gathering of song and Bible reading in Jenny and Pete's Crescent. And they stood apart from one another. And as they started up, residents in the Crescent came out from their homes, stood in their doorways, or came up closer, sat, sat on the walls. Um, and they had a lovely short Easter type service, which I think was a wonderful way it's to such start a great the Easter idea. morning. Isn't it's, it's that great? A great idea. Isn't that great? So now, on a lighter note, Roger. Yeah. <laughs> last Sunday, you admitted that your favorite chocolate was the Lint Easter Bunny. And I can't is, remember definitely. if you said that, and I know this, um, that your favorite way to eat the bunny is to eat the ears off first. I definitely do. So, after the service, Jeff H. sent us this slide that I think was doing the rounds on social media, which we thought was absolutely hilarious. But I was not still expecting to have our lovely little Easter bunny in lockdown. He was supposed to be with somebody at this stage. So, what happened to the competition? Do you think it was just maybe a bit difficult? Do you think the question? Yeah, it might have been. I've, I, I, I have to say, I've never found myself feeling sorry for a piece of chocolate before, <laughs> but, I, but I really do feel sorry for this poor little unwanted Easter bunny in lockdown. And I think maybe the questions were too difficult. Um, what we're asking now just to win this bunny is send in a picture of either the empty cross or the empty tomb or both. Just send it in, uh, take a picture of it, and send it to you via WhatsApp or email. And, and then we'll mm. choose, choose a winner that way. And that, that'll be brilliant. And hopefully our bunny can find a home and a tummy. Yes. <laughs> and, and, and then, you know, we saw that, that picture of Owen having his birthday. And, I, you know, I think that's quite difficult, having um, birthdays during lockdown. Mm. Um, and I've got a birthday coming up, so I'm quite worried about this. And yeah, I want loads of friends around and to be celebrating with people, maybe to go out for a meal with a family and so on. It's feeling a, a, a little awful. And I'm, I, I just think it's, it's, it's really tough on people like me who are having to celebrate their birthdays now. And it, it's bad enough during normal times because there's another man in our congregation who says his birthday is on the same day as mine and I can't see why he should share the same day. Why can't he have it on a different day? It's my day after all. Actually, <laughs> folks, I don't really feel like this at calm all. Calm down, <laughs> calm down. <laughs> what I'm trying to do is show how self-absorbed one can become about things so that you lose sight of 
others and what perhaps really is important. And we want you to remember that little bit of self-absorption uh, for later in the service. But talking birthdays, Andrea had a birthday this past week. Mm -hmm. Alan has his birthday coming up this next week. And on your birthday. Well, yeah, on my <laughs> birthday. And, and, and Sue is celebrating her birthday today. So congratulations, Sue. We do hope you Happy birthday. Are, are able to celebrate. But, you know, birthdays aside, there are other things which are perhaps much more important, which have been um, affected by the lockdown. And one of them is baptisms. We can't have them. So little Phoebe's baptism had to be postponed. And that's not the end of the world. But there are two couples, one whose um, wedding was going to be in June, a new couple to our church family, Christian and Nella, lovely uh, uh, couple who've had to delay their wedding until September yeah. now. It is all happening down in London, but... Um, yeah, do keep them in your prayers. And Dr. Isaac, um, I, I think he will definitely be a doctor in, in the next few days when he gets his results. He's already a doctor, of course. Um, but he and Abby got engaged last year and they're almost certainly having to postpone their wedding. Mm. Uh, so do be keeping them in your prayers. And keep in your prayers people who've lost loved ones. Uh, fortunately, in terms of our church family at the moment, we haven't had a funeral to conduct yet. Um, but in many cases around the country, people can't go to the funerals of their loved ones because they're in lockdown. And so do keep them in, in your prayers to everybody. Mm. Yeah, but we do have some good news as well, I think. We do have some good news. We've got a couple of things and they're both linked with family expansion. The first is that a couple of weeks ago, Nathan and Molly got engaged, which is absolutely wonderful, oh, looking very Look happy there. Um, so congratulations to them and to Joy and David as your family expands. And then another family expansion, Phil and Angela became grandparents to another little baby boy on oh, Easter Monday. Oliver weighed in at eight pounds, three ounces. And congratulations to Sheena and Richard as you settle down to another um, chapter, new chapter with three boys now in your lives. That's brilliant. Yeah, it's really good. So as we come now to start our service, it's a joy and comfort to know that there are good things still happening, that God is a God of order. We see the seasons coming and going as always. Mm -hmm. And let's just pray and commit our hearts to the Lord now as we start our service. Let's pray. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. And yet, as we remembered last weekend, you came down to earth as one of us and rescued us from the punishment of sin by dying on the cross for us. Lord, we live in a world of uncertainty where we think and say things that don't bring honor to you. And for those things, we think of the cross, and we humbly ask that you would forgive us and cleanse our hearts and minds as we turn from our ways and lift our eyes to see the King. We thank you that your love and our security in you is new every morning with the dawning of each new day. Amen.
His Spirit in us, His power within us, and Jesus is the one. So we'll lift our eyes to see the King, lift them to the one who makes us sing. You every morning, a new day is dawning, and we will live for Him. We're in a section now that uh, we've entitled, What Am I? And I want you to look at this picture and try and work out what on earth it is. It's not so easy to see a beautiful color, beautiful uh, shape it looks like to me. Maybe this will help. Uh, this is the top and front. Okay, so there are two colors and it looks like, looks like maybe it's an ornament sitting on a, sitting on a, saucer or something I, I i don't know um if if we move on okay so here's the top and side yeah it's it's a little tiny platform i'm not so sure about being an ornament now um yeah very difficult to know what this is perhaps if we look at the bottom well i don't think that that certainly doesn't give me any further clues i don't know about you so uh, let, let's investigate further okay so there's the bottom and front Definitely made up of two pieces, it looks like. Um, don't know what those dots are. Uh, let's, let's look further. Okay, so this is bottom, front, and side. Not sure that that's giving us any more, except that it almost certainly is two pieces. Um, here's the bottom and the back. Okay, I can see a little... Mm, I'm beginning... I think I'm beginning to see what this might be. Uh, I, I don't know if you've managed to work it out yet. Uh, let's look at the side. Okay, I think I definitely know what this is. This looks to me like two hairbrushes pushed together, uh, being held together by their bristles, as it were. Um, if we... Ah, it's not two brushes, it's a travel brush. Definitely a brush. And if you look up close, there are the bristles. Um, but what we've got to notice is that whether you recognized it or not in the beginning, uh, and that is a travel hairbrush, it remains a travel hairbrush. It doesn't matter whether you saw that or not. That's what it is. Good morning. Jeff and I send our greetings to all our church family. The reading this morning is from Luke chapter 24, commencing to read at verse 13. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast, one of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things? he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him but we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said but him they did not see. 
He said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going further, but they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening, the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognised him and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way, and how Jesus was recognised by them when he broke the bread. This is the word of the Lord.
Before we pray, some words from the book of Nahum. In chapter 1 we read, The Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come to you this morning as a church family. We thank you for the words that we've read of Nahum, written about 2,500 years ago, but so relevant today. We thank you for that reminder that the Lord is indeed good. As we live in a changing world, we thank you that not only are you a caring and faithful God, you are an unchanging God and that we can depend on you. You love this world so much that as we have just remembered at Easter, you gave your one and only son to die and rise again so that we can have eternal life. So as our refuge in time of trouble, we would bring this world that we live in to you. We thank you for all those who are working to care for us through this time. Particularly, we think of our NHS and thank you for that, the doctors and nurses and all workers in the hospitals. We would pray particularly for those locally, for those at Arrow Park and Clatterbridge. Remember also the care homes in our area and the workers in them. We think also of those who are working, the essential workers at this time, those in shops, those who bring the food, those that empty our bins, for the police and for all who work to keep us safe. We pray for our government and the crucial and difficult decisions they have to make. Uh, we pray that your spirit would guide them and give them wisdom. We pray also that you would comfort the many families at this time that have been bereaved, that you would be close to them. We think of our church here at Holy Trinity and pray for each member of the church family. We pray for Roger and Dean, for Paul and Elizabeth and their family, and for Anna and Owen and their family, as the work goes on in a different way. We pray for those uh, of our church family with young families at home. We pray that you would help them to cope during this lock-in period. And for those living alone, we pray that they would know that they belong to a loving church family. We pray for members of the church family in need at the moment. We think of those who are ill and remember particularly Barry and Graham. We will pray for the bereaved family of Sam, Glenys's husband, and remember also Heather and her family after the loss of her father. We know that this virus is affecting most of the world and we would think of the missions that we support throughout the world and pray for safety for them. We think of Lynn in Pakistan as she's working from home in lockdown at the moment and pray for her. This month we particularly remember uh, one of our missions. We remember our friends at St Mark's New Ferry. We think of Andy and Emma and the work that they head up and we give thanks for the way that the church family at St Mark's have been able to keep in touch during the lockdown period. We pray for Peter and Joe. Peter is the curate for him and his wife and family who are relocating to Woking. We pray for young people not taking exams to trust the Lord for their future. And we pray in general for the witness of the church in the local community. And now, as we listen to Roger bring us your word, uh, we pray that we will have receptive hearts, that we will listen and that we will apply to our lives what we hear. So we bring our prayers to you and pray you will answer them according to your will as we bring them to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So we come to the talk for this morning and I've called it, It Is True. Um, as we come to this uh, passage that we're looking at, this very familiar passage, let us just pray for a moment. 
Father, as we turn again to your word, to this uh, lovely story of the two friends walking to Emmaus and being met by Jesus, uh, we pray that we would be encouraged and built up and challenged by this passage, and that you would speak to us through it and help us to apply the things that we learn from it to our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in our story, we have got two friends, one who is called Cleopas, uh, walking slowly back to their village. It's, it's about a seven mile walk uh, from Jerusalem to Emmaus, and they're talking to each other about what has been going on in Jerusalem over the past few days. I feel so sad, said Cleopas's friend. I'm just so disappointed that Jesus died like that. They killed him on a cross like a criminal. Yes, I'm also sad, replied Cleopas. I thought Jesus was the one who was going to rescue us from the Romans, rescue the whole of Israel. I thought he'd be king and rule over us and the world. But he's dead. There's no hope now. We're doomed. You did hear that the women who went to the tomb uh, said they found it empty, didn't you? Said his friend. Oh yes, so, yeah, that they, they found the tomb empty, that Jesus' body wasn't there. And they, they even said that there were some angels who said that he was alive. Fat chance of that, said Cleopas's friend. I know Peter and John also went to check out what the women were saying. And they also found the tomb to be empty, the body gone. But, you know, there'll be a good explanation for that, like there always is. Probably someone came and took the body for whatever reason, who knows. Suddenly, another man was there walking with them. It was Jesus. But they didn't recognize him. The, Bi the Bible tells us that uh, they were kept from recognizing him. So we don't know the exact reasons uh, but, you know, as we've seen, they were so caught up with their own personal sorrow, with their own dashed expectations, with feeling let down, that they certainly wouldn't have recognized Jesus straight away anyway. A little bit like me when I was pretending to be so caught up in my own birthday, so so self-absorbed and, and just thinking of myself and wanting family and friends to celebrate with me. You, you remember that at the beginning of the service and we said to remember it. I was pretending to be self-absorbed, so much so that I couldn't see others around me, let alone their needs. And if I had been self-absorbed in that sort of way, well, then that would be true. And perhaps it was a little bit like that with these two followers of Jesus, so caught up in their personal sorrow and how it affected them that they couldn't see the truth. They couldn't see Jesus even when he was right in front of them, walking along with them. It's also a fact that when you're presented with something you're familiar with, something you know well, like a hairbrush, but it's presented to you in a way you aren't used to, that you often don't see it, you don't recognize it. Perhaps something like that was also happening with these two followers when Jesus suddenly appears with them. Anyway, Jesus asked them what they were talking about, and still they don't recognize him. And they're amazed uh, because they assume he hasn't heard about the events of the past few days. So they tell him all about what's happened, what's been going on, starting way before Good Friday. How Jesus had done and taught wonderful and amazing things. How the priests and the Romans had then eventually had him crucified. They even shared that they thought that Jesus might be the saviour of the world. But now that he was dead, well, they knew he wasn't, but he almost certainly uh, was a prophet. They also told the story of the women who had gone to the tomb and found it open, and how Peter and John had also gone there and seen no body inside the tomb. And they shared how an angel had told the women that Jesus is alive. 
But as neither they nor Peter and John actually saw a living Jesus, well, they certainly doubted that he was alive. Uh, the two friends, well, to them he was dead, as dead as he had been on Friday. And then Jesus rebukes them. How foolish you are, he says. How thick, uh, how slow you are to believe what's written in the Bible. The prophets wrote those words while they were inspired by God. And they tell us that the Savior, the Messiah, the one that you call the Christ, would suffer and be killed. And only after that, after he had risen from the dead, been raised back to life, would he then start to rule as king of the world and reign as king of the world. And as they walked along, Jesus explained to them how their Bible, which uh, was only what we nowadays call the Old Testament, was all about him, who he is, what do you do and teach, and what people should therefore expect. And the hearts of the two friends burned in them, we are told. They sensed the absolute truth of what Jesus was saying. Yet still, they did not recognize him. As they walked a bit further, suddenly the lovely little village of Emmaus came into sight and Jesus pretended that he had to walk on further. But the two had so enjoyed his company, they invited him to come and stay with them in their house because it was already beginning to get dark. And Jesus agreed to do so. Still, they did not recognize him. Cleopas and his friend made a meal and they all sat down to enjoy it. And Jesus took the bread and broke it and shared it with them. And as he did this, they suddenly knew it was him. They could see Jesus. Almost miraculously, their eyes were opened. Just like uh, when you and I could see the bristles of the hairbrush, there was absolutely no mistaking who Jesus was. And as they recognized him, he disappeared from their sight. He was there one moment and the next he was gone. But they were so excited and now started uh, telling each other uh, about everything that happened since Jesus joined them on the road and how he had explained to them the scriptures and how their hearts had burned in them. They, they also were saying things like how they should have known who it was. They should have recognized him earlier when they were together on the road. And they couldn't stop themselves. It didn't matter that it was getting late now. They had to go and tell the 12 disciples. So they ran all the way back to Jerusalem. And they burst into the room where the disciples were gathered. And the disciples were also extremely excited. And, and they burst out saying that Peter had seen the risen Jesus. That it's true. He is alive. And the two friends from Emmaus well, they shared their story as well, how they had been met by Jesus as they walked home, how they didn't know who he was at first, and then how suddenly when Jesus broke the bread, they recognized him. Jesus is alive. It is true. I guess there are several applications of the story for us. And the first is this. Don't let your personal circumstances perhaps the circumstances forced on us by the coronavirus pandemic and having to be closed up in our homes, don't allow your circumstances to make you so self-focused, so self-absorbed that you miss the fact that the risen Jesus is still with us, even in these dark times. If you keep your eyes fixed on him, you will retain a proper and godly perspective on what is going on around you. Secondly, Jesus often comes to us and encourages us through others in ways that we might not expect. Be open to the unexpected blessings that he brings to us. You'll be amazed at how wonderful this can be. 
And then thirdly, knowing Jesus is the risen Lord compels us to take the good news to others. If you know Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, then you will want to share the risen Jesus and his victory over sin and Satan and death with as many people as you possibly can. Of course, you need to do so in ways that people will relate to, in ways that they can understand, in ways that are accessible. So pray for wisdom when you do so. But let me illustrate this second and third point uh, of our application. If you were to meet this man in the street and he came up to you and said that he would like to speak with you, I wonder what you might expect from the encounter. His name is Jason Petty and he's a hip-hop and spoken word artist with the stage name Propaganda. Well, having, having been given that little bit of information, I wonder what you now might expect from a meeting with him if he asked to speak with you. Let me give you a bit more. Jason grew up in Los Angeles, uh, south of that city. Um, his father belonged to the Black Panthers in the 1960s and his parents were divorced when he was fairly young. However, with his mum, he attended church and she forced him at church to take notes of the sermons uh, so that he would listen. And he became a Christian whilst he was still a kid at school. Uh, and since then, he's always felt compelled to share the gospel with others. He graduated from college with a degree in art and intercultural studies and is married to Alma and they have two daughters together. Alma is a Mexican immigrant who has a PhD in educational policy and is professor of education at Chapman University, Orange County. Jason says that the turning point for him in his life was when he finally realized his value is not determined by some innate particular quality that he has, but rather his value is found in the fact that God was willing to pay the cost of his son's life to rescue him. As I said, Jason has always felt compelled to share the gospel with others, but he struggled to know what was the most appropriate way for him to do this. In the end, his, comp his compassion, his passion for and uh, uh, involvement with the hobby of Christian hip hop and the spoken word naturally uh, became the vehicle that he used. His peers um, identified with this. And his albums, therefore, are primarily aimed at young people, but of course, to anyone who will listen. So now knowing all of that, let's listen to him uh, and what he shares through Dare to Share as we watch this video. It's the full story of life crushed into four minutes. The entirety of humanity in the palm of your hand crushed into one sentence. Listen, it's intense, right? God, our sins, paying everyone life. The greatest story ever told that's hardly ever told, God. Yes, God, the maker and giver of life. And by life, I mean any and all manner and substance, seen and unseen, what can and can be touched, thoughts, image, emotions, love, atoms, and oceans, God. All of it is handiwork, one of which is masterpiece, made so uniquely that angels look curiously. The one thing in creation that was made with his imagery, the concept so cold, it's the reason I stay bold, how God breathed in a man and he became a living soul. Formed with the intent of being infinitely, intimately fond, creator and creation held an eternal bond. And it was placed in perfect paradise till something went wrong. A species got deceived and started lusting for his job and odd list of complaints as if the system ain't working and used that same breath he graciously gave us to curse him. And that sin seed spread through our soul's genome. And by nature of your nature, your species, you participated in the mutiny, our, yes, 
our sins. It's nature inherited, black in the human heart. It was over before it started. Deceived from day one and led away by our own lust. There's not a religion in the world that doesn't agree that something's wrong with us. The question is, what is it? And how do we fix it? Are we eternally separated from a God that may or may not have existed? But that's another subject. Let's keep grinding besides trying to prove God is like deep in a lion, homie. It don't need your help. Just unlock the cage. Let's move on on how our debt can be paid. Short and sweet, the problem is sin. Yes, sin. It's a cancer, an asthma choking out our life force, forcing separation from a perfect and holy God. And the only way to get back is to get back to perfection, but silly us. Trying to pass the course of life without referring to a syllabus. This is us. Keep up your good deeds. Chant, pray, meditate. But all of that, of course, is spraying cologne on a corpse. Or you could choose to ignore it as if something don't stink. It's like stepping in dog poop and refusing to wipe your shoe, but all of that ends with how good is good enough. Take your silly list of good deeds and line them up against perfection, good luck. That's life past your pay grade. The cost of your soul, you ain't got a big enough piggy bank, but you could give it a shot. But I suggest you throw away the list, cause even your good acts are an extension of your selfishness. But here's where it gets interesting. I hope you're closely listening. Please don't get it twisted. It's what makes our faith unique. Here's what God says is part A of the gospel. You can't fix yourself. Quit trying, it's impossible. Sin brings death. Give God his breath back, you owe him. Eternally separated, and the only way to fix it is someone die in your place, and that someone gotta be perfect, or the payment ain't permanent. So if and when you find a perfect person, get him or her to willingly trade their perfection for your sin and death in. Clearly, since the only one that can meet God's criteria is God, God sent himself as Jesus to pay the cost for us. His righteousness, his death functions as payment. Yes, payment. Wrote a check with his life, but at the resurrection we all cheered because that means the check cleared. Pierced feet, pierced hands, blood-stained son of man, fullness, forgiveness, free passage into the promised land. That same breath that God breathed into us, God gave up to redeem us. And anyone and everyone, and by everyone, I mean everyone, who puts their faith and trust in Him, and Him alone can stand in full confidence of God's forgiveness. And here's what the promise is, that you are guaranteed full access to return to perfect unity by simply believing in Christ and Christ alone. You are receiving life. Yes, life. This is the gospel. God, our sins, paying everyone life. So three applications. Firstly, fix your eyes on Jesus. Don't let your circumstances blind you to his presence with you even in these dark times. He is here. He is with us. Secondly, Jesus often encourages us in unexpected ways and through unexpected people. So be open to that. Don't close yourself off. And thirdly, knowing Jesus is the risen Lord will take every opportunity to share the gospel with others, but pray for wisdom as you do so. To end, let us pray together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you once again that you loved us so much you sent your Son to die for us. We praise you that through Jesus' death and resurrection, sin, Satan and death are defeated. We praise you that it is in Jesus we find our true identity. Help us to keep our eyes fixed on him, especially in these dark times. Keep us open to the blessings you bring to us in all sorts of unexpected ways and through all sorts of unexpected people. 
please give us opportunities this week to share the wonderful gospel of salvation with others. We ask and pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Drought and storm, what heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving ceases, my comforter, my all in all, in the love of Christ I the words of that song. I get choked up sometimes when I sing it because I think we so often look for our hope and purpose in many things in life, but we don't find it there. We only really find total fulfillment when we come to the God who made us and open our hearts to him. 
because it is in him alone, in Christ alone, that our hope is found. So as we move forward into this week, we pray that you will have a good week recognizing who Jesus is, being certain of who he is, and leaning on him day by day. In a moment, you'll see a Holy Trinity logo come up and you will have the opportunity to click to a YouTube link. We started our service by being reminded that God's love is new every morning. And we're going to end with um, a link to a song by City Alight called Home. And it reminds us that Jesus brings home those who trust in him. And in the meantime, we live life empowered by his grace. So God bless you and have a good week. Bye.